Welcome back, everyone, to Section 3 of Asian Art. Today we're going to begin talking about China and some of its early dynastic art. To begin with, I want to talk about China generally and its sort of extraordinary history. China has, for much of its almost 6,000 years of history, been at the forefront of human civilization. They have at times been as much as 600 to 1,000 years ahead of everyone else on the planet. Take a moment to contemplate that, and to prove my point, let me make you a basic comparison here. Here you see the giant treasure ship that was in the Ming Dynasty when China was at its height of its power. The admiral of this fleet, Cheng He, lived between the middle of the 14th and 15th century. He sailed 67 of these treasure ships, crewed by about 27,800 men. The largest of these ships, and nobody's known exactly certain of their dimensions, was about 600 feet, which would make them the largest ships ever built by anyone at any time. These massive ships carried this huge flotilla of military and scientific uh, researchers, and they sailed out all the way to Africa and around into the areas of the Middle East. The smaller boat you see here, which was about a, a hundred years later, it was one of the more sophisticated boats created by the Europeans. This was Christopher Columbus's ship. The largest of them was about 165 feet in length. I compare these two because when you see the power and majesty of Chinese civilization, it's easy to see that it could have ruled everything all over the earth and made an incredible impression. But at this very pivotal moment, when China was at its apex of its power, it actually made a very important strategic mistake, which was it sort of turned its back on the world. It thought that there was nothing that could challenge it, no one that was of any interest because they had and were the central kingdom. Whereas this small boat, Christopher Columbus's boat, this is the one that ventured out into new territory and explored and eventually discovered a whole new world, really quite by accident. But it's a very important and telling difference here because this small boat actually changed world history. It actually completely opened up Europe to the Americas and provided Europe with this vast access to wealth where it could exploit its power and control and use the resources in the new world to usher in an industrial revolution, which would make them the most powerful people in the world. Whereas China, in its giant treasure fleets, was really sailing along well-known trade routes. And in the end, the discoveries were discarded, the ships were burned and destroyed, and there were laws put in place that prohibited people from going out and venturing the way they had in the past. And so China sort of turns its back on the world at a point when it could have really advanced and instead it decided to embrace its own traditions, its own ways of doing things, rather than learning from the world around it. So you probably have never heard of Zheng He's fleet, uh, but you may have heard uh, him by his well-known uh, name, uh, he was called Ma San Bao, and Ma San Bao, uh, when he sailed all the way to the Middle East, he, many stories were told about him, and they called him by the popular Arabic name Sinbad the Sailor. Ma San Bao was a eunuch 
which means he was a man in the imperial employ. He was castrated in order to achieve a very high rank. This way, he was not seen as an immediate threat to the dynasty of the emperor. We'll talk a bit more about dynasties and emperors and how their power structure worked. But to begin at this point is merely to state that China had, for much of its history, vast wealth and power. And as the largest population on Earth, it controls an incredible amount of potential power today. Let's look at the country of China today. You see that its capital, Beijing, uh, is just north of two rivers. Uh, and this, these rivers were very important places of fertility. As we know, rivers such as the, the Nile River in Egypt was home to a great civilization. Well, China had two of these rivers, and this area is produced in very uh, stable and affluent region here in the far eastern part of China, where really 90% of the population lives, is on that sort of eastern uh, region. Near to uh, China is Japan, and uh, we also have the island of Taiwan, which is an independent country that China claims as a part of its uh, ancient domain. And to the southwest, we have India. And of course, India being its own great power, these two countries were an interest in trading with each other. And we've talked about how they would move to Southeast Asia to conduct their trade. Let's talk now about the ancient civilizations of China and the early history of its dynasties. Legends state there was a Hongshan dynasty and currently some archaeological evidence suggests there may well have been a dynasty way back in Chinese antiquity that was heretofore only regarded as legendary. We know a little bit about the Xia dynasty and we see from this time also this way in which the dynastic rule was passed down through uh, a family. This is where one family sort of controls the power and they go typically uh, from father to son in a, a, a ruling family. And eventually the ruling family is deemed corrupt or un, in, unable to sustain the country. And so there's an overthrow of that into a new dynastic rule. Here we see on the right, the Jiahu symbols. This is probably the oldest um, evidence we have of an early interest in writing in China. Uh, the symbols seem related to or similar to Chinese symbols, but they lack a certain linguistic elements that has been very difficult to interpret whether they actually were uh, a language, recording of language, or they were merely symbolic representations of ideas. So we have in the Shang Dynasty a final sort of coming together of the symbols and ideas of dynastic power and the rise of, of China as this extraordinary powerhouse of innovation where new ideas in working in bronze, the cultivation of the silkworm and the working of jade all and comes in and the writing system uh, begins to occur. There's also mystical beliefs and shamanistic practices that are uh, cultivated and uh, codified at this time. Looking more at the writing system from the Shang Dynasty, we see the Jiaguan, the oracle bones. These bones were usually the scapula of an ox, as you see here, or sometimes it might be the breastplate of a turtle. On these bones, we see inscriptions 
questions that have been asked about the, for the gods and ancestors, questions about when will the rivers flood? Will the barbarians invade? Will the emperor have a son? These are the kinds of questions that sort of perplex things, and they felt that they could seek guidance by these, writing these questions down on the bones. The bones were heated, and then the cracks that formed on the bones revealed secret messages. And then we also even know the answers to these questions would often be inscri inscribed as well. The Oracle Bone script shows that writing was a central idea in Chinese governance, and it was a specialist activity that a few people were preoccupied with, and that through writing, the Chinese believed they had this way of communicating with the gods and with the ancestors. This Oracle Bone script would eventually evolve into what was called Seal Script, which was marked in the bottom of the bronze vessels. Seal Script also becomes sort of the early formalization of a writing system. This would eventually evolve into writing with a brush and creating what became known as Running Script, a kind of faster and looser brushwork. You can see here three characters of the word dragon and how its slow evolution and its related forms can be seen. In essence, for much of Chinese history, a common language linked it through thousands of years of history. A very important idea in Chinese uh, ancestor worship is the notion of jade that as a symbol of uh, divine power and a sort of connection to the gods comes through jade. This is a very old artifact sometime in the fifth to the third century in the Hongshan culture early is a symbol what's called a pig dragon, which is sort of a combination of the pig the idea of fertility of the earth, and a dragon, the fertility of the sky. It's the way it's circled around on itself with a hole, and it was meant it was probably a medallion, and it was uh, worn around the chest. Jade is a very hard stone. It's very difficult to carve. You can't chisel it or cut it. You have to sand it and file it. So this small object would have taken countless hours to drill and cut and shape and sand smooth in a form like this. So jade was so hard and so milky, beautiful and green-blue colors that the Chinese in ancient times believed it was a piece of the sky, not just a stone found in the ground, but actually a piece of the vault of heaven that had broken off and fallen to earth. So to, to wear jade and to possess jade was to possess a piece of the sky that was close to the gods. And so having jade was considered a kind of power and connection to the spiritual world. And so to create um, jade works required a very stable population of dedicated artists who could devote countless hours to their work. Hence the saying from the Book of Rites, if a ruler perfectly observes the rites of state, white jade will appear in the valley. This is a very important idea because stability and order was highly prized in the early dynastic rules. It was felt if you went to war or chose to be belligerent in your statecraft, you were potentially upsetting the natural order of things and working against the stability that was necessary for wealth and prosperity and the ability to honor the ancestors through that wealth and prosperity. Jade continued to be an extraordinary uh, object in used in all kinds of different rites. 
You see here the classic B disc. Usually these are just a circle within a circle. A circle is a symbol of the sky. And here we have these elaborately carved dragons uh, swirling around the inside. The dot pattern on the Zhou Dynasty Jade B disc is actually there to remind us of the pattern that people use when they're planting rice fields. So again, this B disc is a symbol of rain and fertility from the sky at the same time as the fertile abundance of the rice fields. Jade was believed in the Han Dynasty to be so powerful that it could preserve bodies. And for a while in the, in the Han Dynasty, these jade suits were made with, uh, that would completely cover the body and preserve it in an, a pristine state so that it could continue to receive offerings from the people who are living and tending to the tombs. very important technology the Chinese developed was this uh, bronze working. They had a very unique way of working bronze, which suggests they invented it entirely on their own. In their bronze casting techniques, they would build these vessels, and inside the vessels they would, put, they would provide offerings. These were not everyday household objects. These were special vessels, vessels that were here uh, for food or wine often to be given to the ancestors. So it took a great deal of wealth and prestige to be given the right to produce one of these uh, bronze vessels. This is one of the ways in which the emperor could bestow a gift to a devoted follower of the emperor. He could give them the materials they need to create a vessel so that they could honor their ancestors. You also see on the left here a tauti, a beast mask. This is a bronze version of a face, of a, this sort of uh, frightening beast face with claws and horns and these bulging eyes. The beast mask is rarely seen independent as it is here on the left as a standalone object, but it's often incorporated into the surface of other religious objects. You can see if you look closely in the body of the Jew vessel, a beast mask where there's ears and eyes and Fang is curling down. Also, you'll notice a kind of beast face at the top of the handle. These beast masks were an important symbol of power. Their actual meaning is kind of lost to us. Some people say that the Tauti would, ev would evolve into the idea of the dragon. And other people would say the meaning of the Tauti would just kind of disappear. We have no writings that have survived that explain its meaning, but it has an uncanny similarity to what we saw in Bali and Java as the Kirtimuka or Kala head. Um, this is way, this sort of beast protector uh, spirit seems to have been a ubiquitous idea uh, throughout Asia at this time. Here are some of the other kinds of vessels you find in ancient bronze. If you look closely, you'll see many of them um, purportedly have this Tauti face. Another important part of the designs on these bronze vessels is called the thunder pattern. At the end of the Shang Dynasty, we then emerge into the Zhou Dynasty, which was known as the Warring States period. At this point, there was no single powerful state, and the many states throughout the area were competing for resources and for power. During this sort of chaotic period, it was actually rather fruitful for the arts and philosophies of China. 
as many different schools of thought were contending to try and figure out how to move out of this time of confusion and chaos and return to a time of greater uh, stability. Confucius was a very important uh, philosopher at this time. At the same time, there was also another philosopher by the name of Lao Tzu, who was, uh, we'll talk about um, in the ideas of Taoism and I Ching and feng shui. These are all things that were part of the sort of philosophical mix that came to fruition during this time. Let's talk a little bit about Confucius. You've probably heard his name before. The spelling of Confucius is actually based on European understanding of Chinese language way back in the 18th century when the Jesuit priests first came in contact with Chinese philosophical ideas. Confucius was a real person, and I'll talk a little bit about his life in a minute. But to begin with, to get a, sort of a taste of his philosophical ideas, let's look at his quote from his Analects. To study and not think is a waste. To think and not study is dangerous. Here, in a nutshell, is a very interesting idea of Confucian thought. Confucian thought is really focused on education and learning. And he takes this very important idea of improving yourself through learning. And he says that really at the very heart of what we need to do as a civilization to return to a period of stability is to assert, exert our energies and efforts at seeking better and more clear knowledge about our conditions and our situation. Because he says through that sort of investigation, we find a, a virtue. And he said that, that virtuous self, that sort of willingness to investigate something and to seek out true knowledge, this kind of virtue is something that a stable civilization requires. So in this case here, he's saying to study and not think is a waste, which means to sort of learn about something and not really think about it, in the sense not really try and apply it, not really, you know, just study for the sake of studying, learning to pass a test, learning to get, you know, something, you know, done without really understanding the full import of what you're studying. Furthermore, he goes on to say, to think and not study is dangerous, which means to have an opinion, to take action on ideas without actually really considering what you're doing. This is exceptionally dangerous and is one that people who play on hunches and are not really investigating things sincerely this is where we get into a great deal of trouble. Confucianism was enormously influential, but not so much during his own lifetime. Confucius was a minor official. He was born into a noble family that had hit hard times. He was raised by his mother uh, after his father had died and he was, by all accounts, a rather ugly person, and he was picked on and teased. He had a very difficult life, and yet he realized early on that through education he could better himself, and it was only through education that he had any chance at any success. And so he applied himself and became a, a recognized scholar, uh, for his amazing intellect, someone who had ready knowledge of a vast store of facts and ideas. He said at this time, when you study, you should study as if your books could be taken away from you at any moment. And he would clearly hear in that a kind of desperate need to learn and improve yourself and to memorize vast stores of knowledge. He was given a 
position in government as a, a governor of a small province, but he was such a stickler for rules, it's possible that he probably upset the powers that be, and he was eventually uh, went into exile, perhaps forced into exile. It was after his death that his students came together as a private scholar. He had kind of gathered a few hundred students to him who greatly admired his wisdom and knowledge. And then they uh, compiled what they had of, his, of the notes of his talks with them. And these became the basis for the Analects, the collection of his sayings. His students carried on his teachings. There were many schools of thought in China at this time, and Confucianism was none too remarkable. Although it did, 200 years later, in the Qin Dynasty, the Emperor Qin Shi Huang Di had the Confucian books burned and scholars, 450 scholars killed, because it basically purported the idea you need to think for yourself at a time when everyone was made to think as the emperor insisted they think. And so Confucianism fell afoul of that. But it was following this Qin dynasty in the Han dynasty when they were trying to sort of distance themselves all things that came from the Qin. They noted that Confucianism actually seemed to have something very important and that and if the Qins hated it, it must have been something of value that they can use. And so it becomes a very important established ideology for the government in the Han dynasty. Here's an important quote by Confucius. Only when things are investigated is knowledge extended. Only when knowledge is extended are thoughts sincere. Only when thoughts are sincere are minds rectified. Only when minds are rectified are the characters of persons cultivated. Only when a character is cultivated are families regulated. Only when families are regulated are states well governed. Only when states are well governed is there peace in the world. Can you see how he builds slowly idea to idea to idea based on this idea of investigation of knowledge? We become our better selves and our state and our world is regulated by the sincerity of our approach to learning. This all sounds wonderful to me, and I really do value Confucian thought as a kind of clear insight into how a well-ordered, stable society might be run. That said, in Confucian thought, there was always a very clear hierarchy, not only among officials, but among all levels of society. And in those levels, wherever there was uh, gender divisions, the men's status always eclipsed, eclipsed that of the women's status. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the tradition of foot binding, which became a fashion in China about a thousand years ago. This is long after uh, Confucius. And while well, Confucius was not directly extolling these kinds of practices, his teaching eventually evolved into one that codified this idea of status that put women in a lower position as a kind of property of the men. Foot binding, or what was called at the time lotus feet, was a fashion. You could make your foot as small as possible, and women were forced to wear these tiny three-inch shoes. These shoes, the only way you could put them on, you would have to crush your foot. And then once your foot was sort of bound into place, you could not walk unless you were wearing one of these tiny shoes. So for women, it was a symbol of fashion. It was a symbol of uh, elegance and wealth and prestige. It started out among the elite classes 
uh, as something that people who were wealthy could have women that did not require their work. But eventually it spread and descended into the lower classes. Foot binding no longer exists in China. It's been outlawed for almost a hundred years. And there are only a few uh, women, uh, very old women, who uh, still have uh, the possibility of bound feet. I believe I saw an elderly woman in Honolulu uh, with bound feet. But this is something still that represents a kind of class orientation in Confucianism that had a significant impact on the role of women in China.